Okay, great. Um, we might get started. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jo Devlin. I'm currently Associate Dean Research for the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences, and welcome to this month's Dean's Research Seminar. So before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on today, the Wurundjeri people, as well as the traditional owners of the land you are situated on, and acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have been custodians of the lands and waterways of Australia for thousands of years. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Today, Professor Simon Bailey from the Melbourne Veterinary School will present the Dean's lex Lecture, Insulin Dysregulation, Obesity and Laminitis in Horses. Professor Bailey earned his Bachelor of Veterinary Medicine and Surgery at the University of Glasgow in 1993. After time spent in mixed practice in the UK, Simon undertook a PhD at the Royal Veterinary College, London, where he continued in research working in the fields of equine laminitis and inflammation. Simon then worked as a research scientist at the Dorothy Davis Heart and Lung Research Institute at the Ohio State University Medical Centre from 2002 to 2004. He returned to the Royal Veterinary College as a lecturer in 2004, and we were very fortunate that he moved to the University of Melbourne in 2007. Simon has held many leadership roles within the Melbourne Veterinary School, including Associate Dean for Research, Associate Dean, sorry, Associate Dean for Students, Associate Dean Future Programs and Deputy Chair, of one of the largest universities' animal ethics committees. He was director of the DVM from 2014 to 2018, acting head of department for veterinary clinical sciences from 2017 to 2018, and now department uh, head of department for veterinary biosciences from 2019. Simon has many achievements, including being awarded the Dame Olga Ulveroff Research Medal for Excellence in Veterinary Research from the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons in 2005, achieving diplomat status from the European College of Veterinary Pharmacology and Toxicology, and most recently, in August 2021, he was inducted as a fellow of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons for his contributions to knowledge within the veterinary profession. Added to the 1.5 million Great British Pounds in research funding during his time in the UK, Simon has obtained more than $3.5 million in funding here in Australia, including three ARC linkage grants and also commercial contracts. He is highly sought as an expert in the field, most recently sitting on the Australasian Equine Endocrinology Panel, providing guidance for the veterinary profession. Since 2015, he has also served as a panel member of the International Equine Endocrinology Group to evaluate and revise advice given to the veterinary profession regarding diagnosis and features of equine metabolic syndrome. Professor Bailey has supervised 31 PhD masters and honours students and currently supervises six PhD students and a master's student. He has published 112 papers in international peer review journals and three book chapters. He is the holder of two patents and has been an invited speaker at many international conferences particularly talking about equine metabolic syndrome and laminitis. Please welcome Professor Simon Bailey. Thanks very much, Joe, and thanks to the faculty for giving me this opportunity just to um, showcase what our research group is uh, doing. And hopefully there's a, a little bit here for everyone, including uh, a bit of nutrition and pasture management um, and endocrinology. And uh, so hopefully there's something there for our, our SAF colleagues as well. And I know that uh, Frank and Ian Clark, et cetera, do a lot of work in endocrinology. So maybe there can be some uh, suggestions or collaborations or, or something like that that might uh, come out of it as well. So our research group works in a number of different areas. Um, so other areas that we work in are novel anti-inflammatory therapies. So Jenny Bauke, for example, is doing some uh, great work with our collaborators at the Howard Florey on a sheet model of sepsis. We've also worked with uh, um, sepsis models in the, in the horse. Um, we've currently got a, a novel anti-inflammatory compound that's, that's going through the patent process. Um, so I can't talk too much more about that. We've also got um, Jamie Wern doing work on uh, antimicrobial slow release formulation in joints of horses funded by Grace and Jockey Club. And I also do work for Racing Analytical Services and Racing Vic on uh, racehorse doping. So we just finished a project on um, a new detecting method for EPO, erythropoietin. And we've also worked on um, the peptides that were um, used in the, the Essendon Footy Club 
uh, saga to try and make sure they're not used in racehorse doping. So maybe another time I can do a talk on uh, on doping in racehorses. But I wanted to focus today on our work on uh, equine laminitis and metabolic syndrome uh, because that's the work, the area that we've done my, most work on and got most funding in. Um, and that's together with uh, my colleague Nick Bamford. And currently we've got um, two students in this area, uh, Nico Gallinelli and Maddie Erdedy. So what is laminitis? Well, the, the laminae or lamellae are the tissues that um, really are the, the interface between the, the pedal bone, which is the most distal bone in the, uh, the limb, and the, the dorsal hoof wall. So they should be taking all the weight of the horse so it's not going down through the, the sole. But laminitis is really the stretching or breakdown of the tissues supporting the horse's weight across these uh, tissues. And when you think of it, the, the horse is standing on effectively one nail of one finger, and that's effectively the nail bed. So it's extremely painful when that breaks down. So the major welfare implications, laminitis causes a, a really severe crippling lameness. Um, and it's one of the most common reasons for horses to be, to be euthanized. It's also one of the most common reasons for uh, owners to seek veterinary attention for their, their horses and ponies. And it's incredibly common. So we did a, a survey uh, of pleasure horses and ponies a few years ago, and it's based on, on pony clubs. And we found that 15% of these animals had had an episode of laminitis at some point in their life. So it's extremely um, common in these types of animals, less so in thoroughbreds and standard breds, um, but very prevalent in, um, in pleasure horses and ponies. So the Laminae are these, um, these fine leaflets that we see. Um, so these are the avascular epidermal lamellae, which come off the, the dorsal hoof wall. And this diagram down below shows um, that we've got a highly vascular dermal lamellae kind of interdigitate with these leaflets. So we've got the, the pedal bone on the, the left here and the hoof wall sorry, pedal bone on the right, hoof wall on the left. Um, so we've got these highly vascular um, tissues in the dermis. And then the key cells involved in laminitis are these kind of cobblestone cells. These are the lamella basal epithelial cells that sit on the epidermal side. And they are attached to a basement membrane, which is the sort of interface between the two. And if they let go of the basement membrane, then the whole structure separates apart. Um, and there's lots of nerve endings in here. It's extremely uh, painful and, and sore. Uh, there, there are several forms of laminitis. At one point, we thought there was all one common mechanism that linked everything together. But it's now become clear that there are actually distinct forms, even though the end result is, is crippling lameness. So there's an inflammatory form. Um, which I'll talk about in a moment. The most common is this uh, endocrine uh, form of the condition. Uh, also, horses that um, uh, work a lot on, on ra uh, roads get a sort of concussive uh, form of, of laminitis. And if the horse, for example, breaks a limb or uh, is un not weight-bearing on one side and having to put all their weight on the other, then they get a sort of ischemic condition called contralateral limb laminitis, which uh, again results in uh, breakdown. So the inflammatory form is analogous to the, uh, the form seen in, in sheep and cattle, where they get uh, an overload of, uh, of grain. And this may occur also in, in horses with colitis or horses that get into the, the grain store and gorge themselves on grain. So it occurs with um, bacterial overgrowth, uh, either in the rumen in sheep or cattle or in the hindgut in the horse. And the bacteria will produce a lot of lactic acid. It wears down the lining of the gut introduces bacterial toxins into the circulation, and this causes a systemic inflammatory response. And we can see here on this, um, these histosections, um, on the left is a, a normal 
set of lamellae. So we have uh, the primary epidermal lamella and off that comes um, secondary uh, lamellae. And then these are the basal epithelial cells. And we can see in this uh, laminitic section on the right, the whole thing is just completely pulled apart. Um, and it can be very severe and acute um, in this form of, of laminitis. So any horse can, can get this, but it's not that common compared to the other form of, of laminitis that we're now recognizing. So this common form is called endocrinopathic laminitis. This term was dubbed by the US researchers. I'm not sure that endocrinopathic is actually a word, but it's anyway, it's the endocrine associated form of laminitis. Uh, and as we've heard, it, it occurs in about 15% of uh, uh, pleasure horses and ponies, and probably a lot more that are at risk of it. And the typical situation would be um, a pony on uh, lush grass uh, in springtime, and it's that pasture can be extremely high in, in carbohydrate. So many lush pastures, improved modern pastures can be up to 25, even 30% dry matter can be uh, uh, what we call non-structural carbohydrates. That's uh, sugars, starch, and the storage form of carbohydrate in grasses, which is fructans, which is basically lots of um, fructose molecules with a sucrose stuck on the end of it, um, as opposed to the cellulose and hemicellulose, which would be the structural carbohydrates. So this lush pasture will trigger laminitis events and it's less severe than the inflammatory laminitis, um, but the animal's still very reluctant to move and is crippled lame and can be left with uh, chronic laminitis where they have um, these um, abnormal growth rings in the, in the hoof. We get this sort of slippered uh, appearance and we actually get some rotation of the pedal bone within the hoof capsule and we get a sort of wedge of keratin forming um, between the hoof wall and the pedal bone so that the whole thing can take many months to uh, to get right with uh, careful trimming <clears throat> and they can be painful during that time. So it's not all animals that are affected with this condition. Um, it tends to be all the pony breeds, and there are a lot of ponies in Australia, many hundreds of thousands of them, and some horse breeds as well, and typically the Spanish breeds. So Andalusians are a, a popular um, breed in, in Australia as well. And typically, it tends to be associated with high insulin levels that get triggered by lush pasture or grain. And uh, these um, graphs here show some studies we did um, quite a few years ago, but um, we looked at the insulin levels when animals were fed uh, grass uh, fructan. Um, and if you look at the insulins in the, the normals that were not predisposed to, to laminitis, the insulins don't go up very high at all. We've got one outlier here, but apart from that, they all stay within about 40. Um, micro international units per mil, whereas those that are predisposed to laminitis, the insulins go sky high, they go right up into the hundreds. So something's triggering the pancreas to produce a lot of insulin. And this confused us for a long time. Um, also, typically, uh, these animals would have a, a crusty neck and maybe have other deposits of fat around the, the tail head, behind the shoulder, et cetera. So that was also recognized as a, a feature of those that were at risk of uh, laminitis. And then it was only fairly recently, um, 10 or 15 years ago, that we realized um, that it was actually insulin itself that can cause laminitis because we were thinking, well, it, Insulin is a, a hormone that's involved in clearance of, of glucose from the bloodstream. How can that possibly affect um, the foot? Because there are no insulin receptors on the lamella uh, tissues. Um, but it was 
Uh, Martin Silence and his group initially at Wagga and then he moved to QUT at Brisbane, who first showed that if you infuse insulin, give a constant rate infusion for 72 hours, it will actually induce laminitis directly in both ponies and horses. So I mentioned Martin Silence because he will be, um, his name will be familiar to several people in the faculty. He's been working with us on the early career research uh, development scheme that we've been uh, running. So uh, he's a, a friend of the faculty. And so that was a real game changer, showing that uh, insulin can directly cause laminitis. Um, but interestingly, when we look at the histopathology of insulin-induced laminitis, it's quite different from the inflammatory form. So it causes, we saw increased mitotic figures and cell dysplasia, and it's more of a stretching of the, of the lamellae, which eventually break down rather than a, a complete falling apart and detachment from the basement membrane. So it was a, a different mechanism, but there are no insulin receptors on the lamella epithelial cells. So the next question was, what is the mechanism by which insulin can cause breakdown of the, of the foot? And it was actually our, our group at uh, University of Melbourne that were the first to determine this uh, mechanism. So in fact, insulin isn't acting through insulin receptors in this case. Uh, it's actually mimicking a growth factor. So there's a growth factor called insulin-like growth factor, which has a lot of similarities. It's about 87%, I think, homologous to insulin. And therefore, their receptors are fairly similar as well. So very high levels of insulin can activate the IGF-1 receptor. And the IGF-1 receptor is commonly found on epithelial cells. So high levels of insulin are actually having growth factor effects. Quite commonly, um, insulin will be in growth culture medium uh, for cell culture. And again, that's not because there are insulin receptors on the cells we're trying to grow. It's because it's uh, acting through the IGF receptor. And it's the IGF receptor, typically on endothelial, um, epithelial cells rather, that causes uh, proliferative and other pathways to be uh, activated. And in doing that, the cells change their uh, phenotype and uh, change their attachment to the basement membrane and uh, therefore become weakened. And this is um, immunohistochemistry um, staining for the IGF-1 receptor in the lamella tissues and it lights up like a Christmas tree. You see all these brown staining cells here on the secondary epidermal lamellae. These are all the uh, epithelial cells that are um, the major players in, in laminitis. So IGF-1 is a really important growth factor in, in hoof growth, basically. And when that is all stimulated at once out of control, then we get weakening of the attachments and, and laminitis occurs. We confirmed this in uh, vitro. Uh, so we developed a method for culturing lamella epithelial cells in the lab. And when we add, in this case, porcine insulin uh, at different concentrations, we can see there's a concentration dependent um, proliferative um, effect. Um, and we first showed this in, in 2010 with Subu Chokalingam, who was a, a vet student who got a McCarthy scholarship, uh, and later a paper with, um, with Courtney Baskerville. And not only do we see a proliferative effect, we also showed that we can block this using a, an antibody that uh, blocks the IGF-1 receptor. So this was potentially an important therapeutic target for a, a treatment or way of um, preventing laminitis. So that's exactly what we tried to do with um, an ARC uh, linkage grant um, with uh, Zoetis as a, a partner. And this was to develop a, a monoclonal antibody therapy that we could actually inject into horses, block the IGF-1 receptor, and hopefully prevent or treat uh, laminitis. 
And the PhD student was uh, Niv Bathsangam, who was uh, a really whiz um, molecular biologist um, and did a, a fantastic uh, job developing this antibody. There were already antibodies against the IGF-1 receptor. They're commonly used in human therapies, particularly for breast cancer, because it's an important growth factor on um, our breast epithelial cells. But we couldn't give those antibodies into a horse. They'd be recognized as foreign proteins and rapidly um, destroyed. So what we had to do was to manipulate the amino acid sequence of the antibody uh, by a so-called equinization process to reduce the immunogenicity so that the body thinks that it's uh, an endogenous uh, antibody. So we used um, a proprietary um, algorithm based on a, a library of sequences from a large number of, of horses so that we can find out which um, amino acids that we could safely um, change um, in order to um, make it similar to the uh, native equine form. So we did this, we expressed it in a Cho cell system and we purified it to the extent that we could um, then inject it into to horses um, to see if we could prevent uh, laminitis. So we did this proof of concept in vivo study um, up with um, Martin in, in QUT in, in Brisbane. And so in a, a standard bred horses, we gave a constant rate insulin infusion. And to one group, we gave the monoclonal antibody. We actually gave it by regional limb uh, perfusion. So we put a tourniquet on and infused it retrograde in the digital vein into the, the foot. Uh, and then the other group was a, a control that got the insulin, but no monoclonal antibody. And then we also had another group that received uh, neither. So they stayed completely normal. Uh, all the horses that received the insulin infusions did develop um, laminitis. Uh, but those that received the antibody um, had a much reduced uh, severity of, of lameness. Um, when we radiographed the, uh, the limbs, there was uh, less sinking and rotation of the pedal bone within the, the hoof capsule. And when we looked at lamella histopathology, it was much reduced as well. Uh, this graph is just showing the uh, distance between the pedal bone and the, and the sole. So with the positive control, there was sinking of the pedal bone within the hoof capsule, and that was um, significantly uh, reduced with the uh, antibody uh, therapy. Interestingly, <clears throat> although we put the antibody into one limb only, we were hoping to see a, a difference between the treated and the untreated limb. But you can only keep the tourniquet on for 20 minutes or so, and Therefore, as soon as you release it, the whole the antibody will circulate systemically, and it actually improved um, or prevented laminitis in both uh, front feet and, in, in fact, all four feet. So um, it shows that you can give it um, systemically if, if necessary. Uh, and these antibodies are, are designed to circulate for about four to six weeks. So what it would mean as a therapeutic is that you would just need to give a, an injection uh, via the jugular vein every every four weeks in theory to um, protect them against the severity of, of laminitis, which would be uh, really good. And uh, this is the, the histopathology. Um, so in the control uh, horses here, um, we've got a, a primary epidermal lamella here. The secondary epidermal lamellae have been kind of torn off it and we've got islands of uh, epithelial cells left in the dermis here um, and quite a bit of uh, stretching as opposed to the uh, horses that have been treated with the antibody and this is a much more normal looking um, situation with a, a primary epidermal lamella and at the tips here these um, secondary uh, lamellae we've got a few islands of epithelial cells a tiny bit of stretching at the tips um, but otherwise it's looking uh, very normal and these horses uh, clinically were were pretty normal as well so we're now working with uh, Zoetis the drug company to hopefully further develop this um, antibody therapy to uh, market which would be uh, really exciting although COVID has certainly hit all um, research and development in uh, Zoetis and many other 
um, drug companies. So that's still ongoing. So the next part of the puzzle is how can we identify animals at risk of uh, laminitis and how can we manage them so that we don't get this uh, condition? So the uh, general features of animals at risk of laminitis are uh, obesity and or regional adiposity. So we see a, a really crusty neck here in a, a pony. Um, also deposits of fat around tail head here, crusty neck and behind the shoulders. Um, so that's fairly uh, typical of this type of animal. Um, insulin dysregulation is also um, uh, a factor. So uh, insulin levels go very high. And this um, syndrome has really only been recognized in the in the last sort of 15 or 20 years. And I was involved in a, uh, a group of um, experts for the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine that uh, compiled a, a consensus statement, um, which is something they do for um, clinicians in, in several different areas for new, newly described diseases and conditions so that everyone's on the, on the same page. It's already um, pretty well out of date and needs revising, but, um, but really the, the three sort of central parts of it are the obesity, insulin dysregulation and predisposition to, to laminitis. Um, we're now recognising that really it's all about insulin dysregulation and everything else is um, secondary to that. So insulin is the hormone that drives the clearance of glucose from the bloodstream into insulin sensitive tissues, which is primarily the uh, skeletal muscle and also the adipose tissue. There are also insulin receptors on blood vessel endothelial cells. And insulin dysregulation is a combination of, of two main things in this uh, situation. It's the excessive insulin response and production by the pancreas in response to a meal containing um, carbohydrate, so postprandial hyperinsulinemia. And in addition, uh, which compounds that is where you have decreased effectiveness of insulin. So the animal can still clear glucose from the bloodstream, but it needs to produce a lot more insulin in order to do that because the uh, insulin signaling through the insulin receptor is, is down-regulated and impaired. So we get into this kind of vicious cycle uh, where we have this uh, excessive insulin response, um, postprandial hyperinsulinemia, which then further contributes to uh, insulin resistance and insulin resistance means you have to produce even more insulin so we get into this vicious cycle. It's also worth noting that insulin is a really important hormone in terms of obesity so it promotes the uptake and storage of fat in adipose tissue and it inhibits the enzyme hormone sensitive lipase which is involved in fat breakdown. So if you're trying to lose weight, you really have to minimize insulin levels because uh, it puts a complete block on uh, weight loss. So if you see um, a pony, for example, that is obese, chances are that uh, it's also got an underlying insulin dysregulation and that it has this uh, metabolic syndrome uh, phenotype. Uh, and certainly that's very common. So again, we did a, a survey uh, doing body condition scoring and other assessments. Uh, we To do this, we went around a number of pony clubs in throughout Victoria, looked at uh, 229 uh, animals. So this is mainly ponies, also some horses as well. And this phenotype was extremely uh, prevalent. So in this graph here, the, the black bars are the, the ponies. Um, we can see about a third of them are um, over-conditioned and a third of them are obese. So it's probably about two thirds of them were on the obese side of, of optimal. So very, very prevalent. 
much more so in ponies, less in, in horses. Most of the horses were optimal and we'll come on to breeds um, later on. So overall, including ponies and horses, the prevalence uh, of obesity was about 23, just under a quarter um, of animals. Uh, and these are animals that are actually being exercised and ridden at pony clubs. There's an awful lot more animals that are in a paddock somewhere that are not being exercised and are probably just as bad, if not worse. So the overall prevalence of this is um, uh, really quite severe. And it's really interesting to compare, I think, between, uh, between species. So we called equine metabolic syndrome. We call it metabolic syndrome because of analogies with the human metabolic syndrome, which is also known as prediabetes. So in humans, insulin resistance can lead to pancreatic beta cell exhaustion. And that, that's when you no longer have enough insulin to clear the glucose and that can tip you into type 2 diabetes. And both metabolic syndrome and um, Diabetes are both associated with cardiovascular disease. And in cats also, we see quite a clear um, sequence of events from obesity causing insulin resistance and that leading to beta cell exhaustion and type 2 diabetes. Um, the mechanism often is um, with extremely high levels of insulin production from the pancreas, uh, you get deposition of um, pancreatic amyloid or amylin um, protein deposition, um, which leads to the, the beta cell exhaustion. But in many cases in, in cats, if you get the weight off them, their insulin resistance can normalize, they become more sensitive, and you can actually, uh, in some cases, take them off uh, insulin therapy. Um, so there's a fairly uh, clear um, association between obesity, insulin resistance, and beta cell exhaustion. But then when we come to look at uh, horses and ponies, these ponies with EMS, they keep producing more and more insulin from their pancreas. Uh, it goes sky high, but for some reason, it's very rare that they will get this beta cell exhaustion. Type 2 diabetes mellitus can occur in, in horses, but it is extremely rare. So clinics might see one or two cases a year. Um, but considering that um, uh, there may be a quarter of ponies out there with, with EMS, um, it's extremely rare. So why does the pancreas not um, get exhausted? Uh, why does it keep on producing more and more uh, insulin? Um, so, yeah, that, that really could be um, of benefit if we can understand that could be of benefit in the humans and, and cats as well. So um, uh, if anyone's got any suggestions how we can maybe develop that and look at uh, um, benefiting humans and, and cats, um, then that could be a, a useful way to go with this. So understanding why insulin uh, goes uh, so high, why we get into this vicious cycle of um, uh, excessive insulin response to dietary carbohydrates and insulin resistance. This was a subject of another uh, ARC uh, linkage project. Um, and Nick Bamford uh, is now a lecturer in veterinary biosciences. Um, this was the subject of his uh, PhD and, and subsequent uh, work. So we're trying to um, tie all this together. So it was quite an epic study, this one. We um, did a lot of um, diet studies and our experimental horses were uh, a group of uh, ponies, which are um, known to be uh, the phenotype that, that becomes, um, um, develops sort of metabolic syndrome. We also had standard bred horses, which typically are insulin sensitive and are not one of the breeds that gets um, laminitis on lush grass. And to show that it wasn't just a big horse versus small pony um, uh, difference, we also had a number of Andalusian horses. These are one of the Spanish breeds that also get the cresty neck, the obesity, the high insulins, and they're also very prone to laminitis as well. So we had these three groups. 
And we wanted to look at the, the postprandial effect on insulin. So we were doing um, oral glucose tolerance tests, giving them meals with added glucose added to a, a low base ration. And we also looked at the uh, intravenous um, response, response to intravenous glucose and insulin to um, measure insulin sensitivity. So this was a, a frequently sampled IV glucose tolerance test, and we used a minimal model analysis to determine their insulin sensitivity. So this method is a kind of a gold standard. Um, it's a bit complicated. It involves an awful lot of blood samples, so it's not something you can do in the clinic, but it's something we can do with uh, experimental animals. So it involves uh, administering glucose at time zero, um, this top graph shows the glucose response, so it shoots up at time zero and progressively comes down. And then at 20 minutes, we uh, inject a bolus of insulin. So in the first 20 minutes, we're seeing what the animal's own endogenous insulin response is. So that shoots up at time zero. And then by giving a bolus of a known amount of insulin, we can measure the response to that known amount in terms of the clearance of, of glucose. So we get a, an SI value, which is the insulin sensitivity. Uh, and we can also get a number of other indices, including the uh, acute endogenous uh, insulin response. So when we gave a meal containing glucose to this animal, these animals and uh, then took cereal uh, blood samples. On the left, we've got the blood glucose levels. And um, between the three groups there, there's there's not a lot of difference. Uh, peaks about two hours, progressively comes down over the next four hours. But if we look at the amount of insulin that they're uh, producing from the pancreas in order to clear that amount of glucose from the bloodstream, there's quite marked breed differences. So the um, solid squares here at the bottom are the standard breads. They're very insulin sensitive. They don't need to produce much insulin to clear that glucose. But the ponies and the Andalusian animals have to produce heaps more insulin in order to, um, to clear the glucose. So there's a, a real big uh, difference here. So when we uh, calculated the, so when we did the intravenous um, IV glucose tolerance tests, we also saw a difference. Um, when we measured their insulin sensitivity, um, standard breads are much more insulin sensitive than the ponies and the Andalusian groups. Uh, and they're also producing more insulin in response to the IV glucose as well as the oral glucose. <clears throat> so, yeah, we've got two processes going on here. We've got the response to um, the feed and then we've got the underlying um, insulin resistance in these animals. But it's the response to feed that's really important um, because that's what we're seeing in the, the natural uh, situation. And also the stimuli for insulin production uh, is increased when you eat a meal containing uh, glucose because it's not only the absorbed glucose that comes in from the uh, from the intestine that stimulates the beta cells of the pancreas. It's also branched chain amino acids will have an effect, but it's also a couple of other hormones which are present in the uh, gut wall of the small intestine called in cretins, which are uh, secreted in response to uh, carbohydrate in the gut. And they also have a profound effect on um, insulin production from the pancreas. So for the same amount of glucose, uh, if you give it by mouth, you get a lot more insulin production than if you give it intravenously because you've got this incretin effect. So there are two um, main hormones, the uh, glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide and also glucagon-like peptide, GLP-1. Uh, and we've actually done a lot of work sort of mapping where these cells are in the gut. And they're mainly in the jejunum and ileum. Um, so they're these little brown cells uh, that are embedded in the uh, gut epithelium uh, on, the, on the villi. So maybe the amounts of these incretin hormones are different in the uh, animals that show this excessive insulin response. So we looked at that. We um, in these experiments, we, instead of giving glucose, we were giving uh, a 
form of starch. Um, so we're giving micronized maize, that sort of cooked maize to increase the digestibility of it. We were giving it in two daily meals, and then we measured the uh, increasing concentrations as well as uh, insulin and glucose. So again, top left, there's the insulin response to these uh, meals. So again, standard breads, which is a solid circle this time, produce very little insulin. The uh, ponies and the Andalusians produce a lot more. They were fed twice a day. So we see this um, on both occasions. Not much difference in the, the glucose responses. When we look down the bottom here, this is the levels of the, the two incretin hormones, GLP-1 and GIP. And we can see here that the, both the ponies and the Andalusians are secreting a far greater amounts of these incretin hormones uh, from their intestines uh, than the standard breads are. It gets a little bit more complicated when we look at GIP. So ponies are producing a lot of GIP. Um, and the standard breads and the Andalusians were secreting about the same amount, which is uh, interesting. Uh, but it certainly looks as though that could be one of the mechanisms um, causing this excessive insulin response in uh, ponies and Andalus Andalusians. Um, but there were marked differences in phenotypes, um, very different types of animals, if you like. and we get not only this increased, increased um, response to dietary carbohydrates, which are probably in part at least mediated by the incretins, but also there's an underlying difference in insulin sensitivity. And that the two really go hand in hand. So there's still more to um, understand in terms of these mechanisms. Um, and what causes this vicious cycle to occur uh, and insulin resistance to develop. Um, we wanted to understand whether obesity was, was playing a role because obesity uh, in many other species, including humans and cats, can cause insulin res resistance. And that's because as we put on weight, our fat tissue gets infiltrated with um, macrophages and produces pro-inflammatory cytokines. It's often inflammation that will lead to insulin uh, resistance. And also fat tissue will produce a lot of uh, other factors. There's uh, a couple of hormones, for example, that are really important that get produced by fat. So leptin is one of them and adiponectin is another one, which is, that's a good guy. It's anti-inflammatory. It improves insulin sensitivity um, and other uh, functions. So in another study, we made all our animals obese. We took them from a moderate to an obese body condition score, uh, but we did that in different ways. So some of them, we um, made them obese using a, a high fat diet that didn't have a lot of carbohydrate in it. Uh, so we gave them a lot of oil and vegetable fat in the diet to see whether making them obese on a high fat diet would cause the same effect as making them obese on a high carbohydrate diet. So the control group here was the, uh, those getting the, the grain meal. So we fed them for uh, 20 weeks and uh, we looked at their changes in insulin sensitivity and their weight gain as well. We used quite a novel method to look at body fat change, and that was a heavy water method, uh, a so-called deuterium dilution. So by injecting heavy water in, uh, that will distribute to all the body compartments apart from fat because there's no water in fat tissue. Um, and then if you take a sample four hours later and send it off for isotope analysis, um, if you know the weight of the horse and the weight of the fat, then you can uh, well you can work out the uh, percentage body fat quite uh, accurately. So at the end of the twenty week um, study, uh, this is one picture. This is actually the sorry one one pony before and after. Um, so he's he's become a lot more obese. The percentage body fat went up from about seven or eight percent uh, up to about sixteen seventeen. Um, but it stayed the same in the in the control group that uh, wasn't um, fed the high calorie diet, and that's what we expected because these two diets were isocaloric. But when we looked at the insulin sensitivity, we found that the animals fed the high carbohydrate diet had become insulin resistant, but those 
fed the high fat diet stayed insulin sensitive, the same as the control diet. So it's the carbohydrates in the in the diet that uh, were causing the change in insulin sensitivity, rather than the um, just the fact of being uh, obese. And when we separate by uh, breed, um, there are breed differences as we found before, but the, the overall pattern was the same. Um, that it, those on the high carbohydrate diet, the CHO diet, um, really did uh, decrease their insulin sensitivity quite markedly. And we think that may be due to chronic low grade inflammation um, because. We looked at some inflammatory markers. Adiponectin was one of them. Uh, that was decreased uh, in the carbohydrate group. And serum amyloid A, which is a, um, a acute phase protein produced by the liver in response to inflammation, uh, that was increased. So we've got more work to do in this regard, but there seems to be some sort of inflammatory response to long-term carbohydrate feeding in these animals, uh, which is driving insulin sensitivity. And in those animals that are already predisposed to it, uh, the effect is much more uh, marked. So in fact, we think um, horses and ponies are actually fairly well adapted to being obese uh, in many circumstances. Um, they need to be obese going into winter and then lose that um, fat over the over the winter. So obesity, unlike other, spe uh, other species like cats and humans, is not really a pro-inflammatory condition, but it, we can have inflammation causing insulin resistance if they're fed a, a grain uh, diet or potentially uh, fructans from grass. So we're going on to do some gut microbiome work um, and other work to see whether there's a sort of leaky gut syndrome or changes in the microbiome that might be uh, driving this. So we're collaborating with um, colleagues in Minnesota um, to do this. So in the last couple of slides, I want to sort of put this in uh, some more context on this. Um, why we're getting this phenotype in ponies and certain breeds of horses is um, is really interesting. It tends to be the the Spanish breeds of horses um, that we see this in. So Andalusians, which are fairly popular in Australia, but there's lots of other um, Spanish breeds, um, particularly popular in the the US. So we've got Morgans, Pasifinos, Saddlebreds, Tennessee Walkers, Spanish Mustangs, etc. And in South America, the the Mangalaga Marchador breed and Criollos, etc. Um, they're all of the same phenotype and very prone to, to laminitis. If we consider where the domestic breeds came from many thousands of years ago, I think we can um, um, kind of see what is underlying this. So if we go back to the end of the last ice age, um, the, the Pleistocene era, sort of as recently as 11,000 years ago, there were about four uh, subspecies of equid from which, which our um, modern breeds are developed. So one of them shown in blue here is the Western European subspecies, Equus caballus caballus. And it's from this subspecies that all of our ponies, which tend to be mainly British native ponies, and the Spanish breeds are all developed from this subspecies. And at the end of the last ice age, the whole of northern Western Europe was extremely uh, arid environment. Some parts still are to this day. This is um, Shetland ponies in the Shetland Islands here, bottom left. Um, this is uh, Andalusia in Spain, some Andalusian horses. Quite an arid environment. They developed to become quite thrifty. So by producing a lot of insulin, it means that they can store the energy, the meagre energy that they can get from the, the pasture. Um, and store it up um, effectively. So it's termed the, the thrifty phenotype. Uh, unlike other uh, horse breeds, the standard breads and the thoroughbreds, which are developed from um, Arabian horses, and they were developed from a different subspecies, shown in red here, the Afro-Turkic subspecies. Um, so obviously there's been a lot of inbreeding uh, over the years, but... Um, Still to this day, we're seeing the differences depending on the, the uh, basic subspecies that they come from. So 
it's hardly surprising if we take animals that are adapted to quite a harsh arid environment and we put them onto a um, lush modern pasture, uh, which are agronomist colleagues have developed over the years to be as high as possible in carbohydrate to optimize growth rates in cattle and sheep. Um, so it's no surprise that they're um, really not suitable for uh, putting these uh, thrifty animals onto. So it's a combination of underlying genotype in an abnormal environment, um, and we get this epigenetic effect. So preventing laminitis um, maybe one way that we can think of doing this is by looking at the, the pasture. Um, the, people try sort of strip grazing or pre-grazing, um, but um, still most modern pastures, fescue, ryegrass, et cetera, are very high in um, non-structural carbohydrates. Uh, one thing that uh, I'm doing on my own property, I've seeded a couple of um, paddocks with Australian native temperate grass species like bluegrass, redgrass, weeping grass and wallaby grass. It's um, not easy to do. It's very expensive uh, just for a sack of grass seed. It costs about $700 um, and it's very slow growing. Um, and maybe some of our staff colleagues can advise me on what more we can do to um, uh, improve the use uh, and availability of these sorts of species, but that may be a way to go. Um, but certainly much low, lower in non-structural carbohydrates. Uh, exercise, we've also done some work on. Exercise can improve insulin sensitivity. Um, again, it's not easy for a lot of animals, uh, a lot of owners rather, to, to do, to exercise their animals every single day, um, but that can improve things um, in addition to calorie restriction, which is the most important thing. And I realise time's getting away from me slightly. So I'll just um, finish up by uh, talking about our, our current work. So we're onto another ARC linkage project. And here we're looking at um, uh, older geriatric horses, which get pituitary dysfunction. Again, a very, very common condition that we really don't know much about. About 20% of older horses will get pituitary dysfunction. Uh, it's due to a progressive uh, loss of dopamine within the CNS and um, Again, interesting uh, species comparison in humans with low dopamine, they get Parkinson's disease. In horses with low dopamine, uh, they get insulin dysregulation and laminitis. So we're trying to figure out what's, uh, what's going on here and the role of dopamine. Um, but that's sort of work that's uh, currently ongoing. So I'd better wrap things up there and just uh, acknowledge um, my colleagues and um, students and many collaborators and funding bodies and I'll be happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you. Thank you Simon for that um, very interesting talk from a scientific perspective but also from my own perspective of trying to manage um, founder prone ponies. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions so just um, if anyone's got a burning question just pop them in the Q&A there please rather than the chat. Um, while people are doing that I'll, I'll ask a quick question. Um, Simon, I was really interested in the consensus statement, which is obviously really helpful for the veterinary profession in terms of understanding EMS. I was wondering if you had a feeling for how well kind of the next level of communication from the veterinary profession to the horse owners is going around EMS. Do you think that there's a good level of understanding out there about EMS in, in horse owners now? Um, I think, yeah, that there's... Um a great deal of awareness now. Um, so there's lots of articles in the horse magazines. Um, I've written a few for sort of horse deals, horses and people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they'll often run uh, articles, especially this time of year. Um, so, yeah, even when we went around the pony clubs in, in Victoria, we were sort of doing a sort of education spiel as well to the little kids and their parents. Um, and it's amazing even how much the little kids knew about not to put ponies out on, on lush pastures and they, it's surprising how much they knew about it. But again, with the horse owning population, um, there's a lot of sort of misinformation out there as well and half information. So it's, it's an ongoing um, uh, process to, um, to get the information out there. And it, it's even uh, informing vets as well that some of this is fairly recent uh, and a lot of vets out there don't fully understand it um, and fully understand the, 
principles and what we can and can't do in terms of treatment and management. Great, thank you. So there's a couple of questions um, in the Q&A. So if there's time, um, would we please be able to um, unmute Reza for to ask his question? Excellent, thank you. Uh, hi, Simon, great talk. Hi, um, I was just wondering if we know um, IGF-1 could actually reproduce those effects insulin might have or has actually based on your data on the hoof lamina. Um, has that been actually shown? Um, we've shown it, it well, in vitro with cultured epithelial cells, lamellar epithelial cells, you get the proliferative effect. No one's actually shown it in vivo. I think it would be, first you'd have to make the equine form of IGF-1, which we did, um, but it would be really expensive to get enough to put into horses. So we've not we've not tried doing that. But I think showing that we can block it using the antibody against the IGF-1 receptor, right. I think is pretty yeah. good evidence that that's the pathway that it's working through. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Thank you. Uh, another question, this might have to be our last one. I apologise. I'm just looking at the time and I know a lot of people will have one o'clock commitments, but um, Simon has said that he's happy to, to answer questions directly um, after this, perhaps via email. Um, so we have a question from Steve Dennis, a uh, comment and a question from Steve. Can you hear me all right? Oh, yes. Come yeah, so, Simon, I've worked in Central Highlands, Victoria, around Ballarat and, and used to, you know, see masses of, of obese uh, laminitic ponies when in, in the uh, lushness of spring. And then I now work in southeast Queensland. We get the, the subtropical range in the wet season. It's incredible flush of pasture and nothing like the amount of laminitis. So I, I know it's a difference in regional grasses. I just want to know if you can speak to that perhaps and there's a few clues. Yeah, well, I'm not an expert on on grasses, but um, certainly there are various um, types of grass up in, in Queensland. I've certainly done some studies with Rhodes grass, um, which is much lower in, in fructans. Um, so, yeah, that, there may be some uh, scope for using those uh, more uh, down here. Uh, although the the sort of more southern temperate grasses like wallaby grass might be might be better for for Victoria, um, but yeah, definitely it's linked to the the fructan levels, um, mm. and yeah, it's, it's certainly in the typical sort of ryegrass and fescue types, uh, it, it gets incredibly high. So um, uh, yeah, it's it doesn't surprise me that in some parts of Queensland, yeah. It, you could get away with it being being on lush grass and not getting laminitis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, so there's lots of um, comments in the chat too, Simon. Um, thanking you for that great presentation. So thanks again, and thanks right. everyone for coming along um, to this seminar today. Um, our next seminar is on the 12th of October, um, and we have Andrew Fisher talking about um, improving the welfare of calves. Um, so we hope you can join us then as well. Um, so thank you for coming and thanks again to Simon for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all. Cheers.